here at Haymarket Good Baptist Church. Uh, very, very pleased to, uh, to see you on this beautiful spring day. And finally, spring weather is arriving this afternoon. If you're pleased about that, Alexia, we're ready for spring. We, uh, we have friendship registers, worship registers, right there at the center aisle. If you're the person on your pew that's supposed to the center aisle, please take that book and sign your name. Uh, and then either some sort of contact information, a phone number, a home address, email, whatever you feel comfortable sharing, and then pass it to the outside of the pew. And when the last person signs it, then send it back to the center and leave it where it was uh, first found. We appreciate that very, very much. Uh, we have several announcements I'll call your attention to. You see there's a bulletin insert about the Hope Tree Classic Golf Tournament. And, uh, it is to raise money for Hope Tree. It used to be the Baptist Children's Home, uh, but it's a great Christian ministry. The details are there. And although there are four men in the picture, women are allowed to play ball too. And uh, I've seen lots of pro women on the tour that can wipe any man out. So if you ladies want to play, you sign up uh, as well. Just contact me and let me know if you would like to play. And we'll send one or two or three teams uh, of golfers down to Richmond for this tournament. So you got to contact me or Edith. Edith, raise your hand. Either one of us, let us know, and you can sign up for this tournament. Uh, we have several other announcements. Uh, in particular, there's a last summer dramatization that's coming on Thursday, April 9th. Uh, and the rehearsal for that is Sunday, March 15th, next Sunday, immediately after worship. Uh, but uh, if you're not in it, I hope you'll at least plan to come to it on Monday, Thursday, that is the Thursday of Holy Week, April 9th. Put that in the calendar. We need two more apostles. So if you would like to be an apostle, uh, you have to end up looking something like one of the apostles in the Da Vinci's Last Supper painting. Uh, but we can, we can give you a beard or more hair or less hair or gray hair, whatever you need, we can, we can do all of that. So we do see Edith if you're willing to uh, volunteer for that as well. Now, I think most of you, but maybe not all of you know, um, if we were to have uh, Reverend Alan Smith here this morning, he was going to be helping lead worship, he was going to be preaching the sermon today, uh, there's going to be a reception immediately following worship, and uh, there's a Q&A, a chance for you to ask your questions, and he's a candidate for associate pastor for community outreach. Unfortunately, Alan was at a conference this week in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. There was a break time in the conference, and he decided to go to the gym at the University of Tennessee gym and play a pickup game of basketball. And it went badly for him. He tore his knee, tore the patella tendon, which connects the kneecap to the lower leg, and had to have major surgery Wednesday night. He was still hopeful that perhaps he could get his parents to drive him all the way up here and he could then stand stiffly and preach the sermon and then go on crutches to the fellowship hall. But at the end of the day, he thought, you know, I'm not going to be at my best. That's going to be really exhausting. And so how about if we put this off for several weeks or months or whatever it takes? And I told him, of course, we would do whatever he, he would like. So he has sent me this letter and asked me to read it to you. So this is from Alan Smith. To the congregation of Haymarket Baptist Church. I do not begin to express my disappointment and sadness that I am not with you in person this morning. As you have probably heard, I ruptured my left patella tendon playing basketball in Tennessee on Wednesday morning during a Baptist minister's conference. I had surgery on Wednesday <coughs> evening and am now recovering at home with my parents in Greenville, South Carolina. I really wanted to make it to be with you in Haymarket for such a special Sunday in the life of the church and for me personally. In the end, though, it was all I could do to arrive from Knoxville, Tennessee to Greenville, South Carolina, where I will be for the initial stage of rehab process. I am so grateful for your prayers. What a humbling way to become familiar with the congregation. <laughs> by receiving your prayer and support. It is clear that you're a loving and caring community of faith, as I have felt warmth both from the search committee as well as Dr. Olson, <coughs> Excuse me. who 
has been nothing uh, short of supportive, even in several phone calls late this week, as I discerned the best course of action for this weekend. Know that my disappointment uh, in not being there today is also coupled with my sincere excitement for the role. I look forward to joining you when that can occur, hopefully sometime in the next several weeks. I have an appointment with an orthopedist in a couple of weeks to determine how my knee is progressing and how much travel and mobility that I can manage. I look forward to maintaining close contact with Dr. Olson as we look to schedule my meeting with you as a congregation as soon as we can. I've been so encouraged by the way Haymarket Baptist Church has designed the role related to community outreach and the graciousness of each individual that I've met has only affirmed my sense of call to your church. I cannot wait to move forward with you and consider this delay only a minor setback in our story together. With grace and peace, Alan Smith. Many of you have already signed the card, but if you came in late and didn't get to sign it, or for whatever reason didn't get to sign it, uh, we have the card on the podium <coughs> in the overflow room, so after service you can just go there and add uh, your signature. Uh, and if you want a special note to, uh, to Alan to let him know we're all praying for him to get well <coughs> soon. Now, um, we have a lot of visitors. I've had a few people express concerns that with the coronavirus and so forth that uh, hugging and, and so forth might not be appropriate. So I'll just say, we do want to make people feel welcome. So let's stand. You can fist pump. No <laughs> elbows. It's up to you. Just make it clear. If you don't want to hug, just put the elbow in the fist pump out. It will not, will not hug your fist, I promise. So, but let's do at least give a warm welcome to one another. Let's stand. Hey, good morning, everyone. Let us meet him and ask our questions 
uh, so that we can have a, a meeting and vote on him as associate pastor for outreach. We are also thankful, Father, that you have brought so many of us together today on this beautiful spring day, and that we can come as people who are thankful for the many blessings you send our way. Perhaps the greatest blessing of all is the sending of your son, Jesus Christ, who is the one who showed us how to live, showed us how to love, and taught us how to pray when he said to his disciples, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
I'll be reading the part labeled Worship Leader in WL, and I'll ask you to respond by reading the full face print labeled Worshippers or the Ball. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And now I turn back to hymn number six, one of our all-time favorites, How Great Thou Art. <clears throat> and let's stand, and we will sing all four verses together.
17 through 32. Let me invite you to read along in your own Bibles. And if you forgot your Bible, you can pull out one of the Red Q Bibles. It's on page 1669 in your Red Q Bible. Or as JT has, you can have your own Bible on your phone. That's a great way to do it. Technology can be our friend. John 11, verses 17 through 32. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever believes by believing in me, whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. And after she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher's here, she said, is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. And now it's time for the children's sermon, so I'll invite all of our children to come forward. Jeffrey, and Lisa. But Lisa's not really that much part of today's story, so she must be lost somewhere with a friend, you think? Yeah. So today's story is mostly about Jeffrey. Yeah, that explains a lot. It does. <laughs> On this particular day, Jeffrey was having a lot of fun with some of his buddies. They were out running around on the playground, and then they were throwing the ball. Did you ever play dodgeball? Yeah, all right. Well, Jeffrey was big time in the dodgeball, loved throwing that ball. And then one of his buddies got the ball and was throwing at Jeffrey, and Jeffrey tied the dodge out of the way, but he tripped and fell, but he wasn't falling on the ground, he was falling on the asphalt. Asphalt, that's the hard black surface, like the surface of the road or a playground. And guess what happened to his knee when he hit the ground? What? He skinned his knee, and what started coming out? The yeah, blood. blood, just like your shirt, that same color. How about that? And Jeffrey started to cry. He did. He started to cry. And a couple of his buddies said, "Big boys don't cry." Cry. They started razzing him, and that made him feel even worse. <laughs> <laughs> Tell the story for me today. This. He wasn't happy about crying in front of all his friends, but it really hurt. And even though mom cleaned him up, she put stuff on there that sometimes hurt a little bit too. She said it was good and killed all the germs, but he felt like it stung a lot. And then he talked to his mom and dad, and he said, is it true that I should never cry? And mom and dad said, well, let's look in the Bible. Did Jesus ever cry? He did. Now, we read the first part of the scripture, and you guys are going to be gone for the second part of the scripture, but let me tell you the rest of the story that I'm going to read to the adults in a few minutes, okay? 
Jesus went to the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Those are three good friends of his. They're all two, two sisters and a brother. And Lazarus has just died. Pretty sad time. Have any of you guys ever been to a funeral before? Oh, a couple of you have been to funerals. Well, I've got to tell you, at funerals, sometimes even adults cry. If you're an adult who has cried at the funeral, would you please raise your hand? Look, turn around, children. Lots of them have cried. Now, it's true that we don't want boys or girls to be crying every time some little thing goes wrong. If someone cries five times every day, that's just... That's a boy. appropriate to cry. And in the story that Jesus, that we're telling about Jesus, the scripture I'm reading the rest of the day, <clears throat> when Jesus comes to the tomb of Lazarus, he thinks about his friend Lazarus being dead, and guess what? The shortest verse in the Bible is two words. <coughs> Jesus wept. Which means Jesus cried. So even if Jesus cried, there are some times when it's okay for us to cry. I have seen great athletes who were very brave and could take the toughest hit and not cry at all, but when their team lost the championship game, I've seen them cry. I have cried at my dad's own funeral because I love my dad very much, and when he died I was very, very sad. And I don't think God was unhappy with me for crying. There is a time to cry, and the fact that Jesus did it lets us know that at the right time, we can cry also. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for each of the girls and each of the boys here today. And I, I do pray that you will help them understand when is the right and appropriate time to cry. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, time for children's Sunday <coughs> our hymnal and uh, turn to hymn number 384, the Servant Song, and let's stand and we'll sing our offertory hymn together. Let's stand.
First Corinthians 4 2 says, it is, Now it is required that those things have been given, a trust must prove faithful. Today we return a portion of this bounty to you. Bless this offering and use it for further your work. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. <laughs>
second part of the story, which I started earlier, is our second scripture reading for today from John chapter 11, verses 33 through 44. And again, I'll ask you to open your Bibles or pull a few Bible out. The Red Pew Bibles is on page 1669. Gospel of John 11, verses 33 through 44. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. And then the Jews said, See how he loved you. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? And Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, at this time there's a bad odor. He's been there four days. Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? And so they took away the stone. And Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you. God wanted us to learn more about love even than we can learn from the Old Testament, though there are many lessons about love from the Old Testament. But he sent Jesus so we could see what love looks like in human form. And Jesus Christ not only teaches about love, though he certainly does that, he also shows us what love is like. He spent three years training his disciples and teaching them doing miracles, rebuking them at times, as every good teacher sometimes has to rebuke a student. He had lunch with Zacchaeus, who was a man far from God, who had cheated people and was very wealthy. And Zacchaeus came back to God because of that lunch. <coughs> Jesus talked to the Samaritan woman at the well, who had been very sinful, and who knew she was far from God, but he cared about her. And he sat down and invited her to come back and to have a meal with him at Zacchaeus' home. He forgave the paralyzed man and showed love to him. And now he stopped at the house of Mary and Martha. And we hear the story about Jesus and Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. Now, even though we read a lot today, I really didn't read the entire passage. It starts all the way back in 11, chapter uh, 11, verse 1. But uh, early on in the chapter, it says that the sisters had sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. So there it is. I mean, Jesus was very close to Lazarus. He, he cared about him very much. And when you, when you care about someone a lot, it means... You may have a lot of pain. How many of you have loved someone and that love has caused you pain? Look around the room. Almost every hand is, is up. When I was a teenager, Simon and Garfunkel had a song. And they talked about this reality that when you care about someone, you feel pain. And so they, they wrote these words, I am a rock. And the words go, hiding in my room, safe within my womb, I touch no one, and no one touches me. I am a rock. I am an island. And the rock feels no pain. And an island never cries. And that is true. But that is a very sad way to go through life being removed from people so that you will not feel the pain 
that love sometimes brings. Being a pastor means not only do you have your own pain, but you get to share deeply the pain of your entire congregation, and you see the difficult times that they go through. I think of Hansford Sullivan in my first church, Berea Baptist. And when I got there, Hansford Harder ever came to worship. And they told me he is a very faithful Christian and used to be here every single Sunday, but his wife is an invalid. She doesn't respond. She is in a bed. And he stays home with her pretty much all the time, and he turns her regularly so that she will never get a bed sore. And he did that for five years. I came to Berea probably at the end of four and a half years of that period. And then after six months when I was there, his wife died and I did her funeral. And after that, Hansford was back in church every Sunday. But he said, I made sure that she never had a bed sore. And you, you see the pain that he went through watching his wife that he loved dearly and all of the problems that she went through that led to her final stages. And yet, I think if you'd ask Hansford, would you rather have never met the woman so you wouldn't have experienced that pain, he would have said no. The pain was part of the love. That's what God intended, and that's what God wanted a good husband to be. And he was there for her. One of the great joys I saw was a about three or four months after Hansford's wife had died, or maybe it was six months, I don't remember how long. Remember, of course, she had been non-responsive for five years. I looked in the back left, where Hansford always sat with a couple other guys, and he wasn't there. I was surprised, because he was always there. Once his wife had died, he was there every single Sunday. And then I noticed that right next to Virginia Sale, on the right side was Hansford Sullivan sitting next to her. She was a widow. And uh, a few months later, they came to me and asked if I would do their wedding. And I, I, was, I was delighted. Hansford understood that part of loving someone means that you have to feel the pain as well. God gives you the joys. He also gives you the pain. And you have to understand that. Death, of course, brings some of our greatest pains. When I think of times that I have seen people cry so often at, at funerals, or at the time that someone is dying. Uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote a great <coughs> classic on death and dying. She described as a psychologist the, the different stages of grief that people go through. Uh, a first stage for many is denial saying, absolutely not, the doctor must be wrong, the news can't be as bad as the doctor is saying. Then some people go through a stage of anger where they're mad at people. Sometimes someone that just got bad news about themselves or maybe about a loved one might be pretty irritable and become angry very easily. Sometimes people get to bargaining. They offer promises, sometimes to God, if God will do a great miracle. And then there's... a uh, Depression. Sometimes people are depressed. Minerth Meyer, uh, two psychologists who wrote many studies about the human condition, said that genuine grief, showing grief, is vitally necessary. Individuals who suffer a significant loss should definitely have a good cry. Not grieving can lead to a low-grade depression that can last for many years. When I was in seminary, I served Hickory Grove Baptist Church for two years as their part-time youth minister. And I would drive 100 miles from Louisville, Kentucky, up to Independence. Uh, that's northern Kentucky, right outside of Cincinnati, Ohio. And I served that church with joy. They treated me very well. It was a great experience, a lot of nice teenagers that I really enjoyed. And right before I finished my term and graduated from the seminary, the church secretary, who was maybe 19 or 20, very young, there was a terrible train accident. The train hit the, the car, her family was driving in. She wasn't in the car, but she lost a parent and I think two siblings who were killed in that terrible train accident. And the next time she came to church and I saw her, I tried to understand her grief, and she just smiled and said, I'm fine. Uh, what, what do you have for me to type on? 
If she didn't want to deal with grief in any way, shape, or form. And of course, you can't make someone deal, deal with it. But I, I had to think that that wasn't a healthy way to, to deal with it, because deep down inside, it's got to be tearing you up to lose people in such a terrible way. From the time that we are small, and especially, at least back in my day, especially if you were a boy, you heard the phrase, big boys don't cry. And of course, as a little boy, you cry when you fall down and all sorts of things. But you figure out fairly quickly, if you want to be counted as a big boy, and of course, a little boy wants to be a big boy, that you better not keep crying, at least not so often. And it's tough. You, you learn to put the crying deep down inside. Some men learn the lesson so well they never cry after that. And I, I think that that is a, a, a problem. Linda and I have been watching uh, the Netflix series called The Crown. It's about Queen Elizabeth. And it, it really tells the story pretty accurately, historically accurate. And we've just come to the episode where there's a terrible, terrible accident, a tragedy in Wales in a mining town where a huge amount of sludge from the mine uh, breaks loose and flows down the hill and, and crashes into an elementary school. More than a hundred children are killed by this terrible tragedy. And uh, some of the political leaders encourage the queen to go visit this little mining village and she does not want to go. And uh, finally she, she gives in because of public pressure and goes to visit. But she explained to the Prime Minister that ever since she's been a little girl, she is unable to cry. She said, it just, it just doesn't come to me. And people look at me and assume that I don't care. But that's not true. Deep down inside, I, I really care. I think for most of us, it's healthy to show that we care and at the appropriate time for us to cry. Now, sometimes there's a price to be paid. 1972, when uh, it was about this time of the year, all the politicians were vying to see who was going to uh, run. And that year, the Democrats were trying to choose a, a challenger to Richard Nixon. And Edmund Muskie was one of the favorites. But there was a public lecture, a public discussion with a microphone. And he talked about some accusations, I think, uh, about himself. And he broke into tears. And a lot of people think that cost him the Democratic nomination for president in 1972 because a lot of people said you shouldn't be crying if you're male. But I think that's really unfortunate. Crying is innate, it's part of God's design. From the time we're little babies, we cry. The first thing a healthy baby does is what? Cry. There was a study done in 1967. They had eight mothers listen to tape recordings of their baby, but 30 other babies. So it's 31 total babies to study. They tape recorded all 31 of them. They picked out eight moms, and they had them listen to all 31 cries. Every one of those moms could pick out their baby's cry. It's unique. It is a good thing. It's designed by God. And I think there are times to cry. And my ultimate example, of course, is from the life of Jesus the shortest verse in the Bible. Some of you have teased about this verse. When you were a teenager or in some situation where you had to learn a Bible verse, some of you said, I've already got my verse. <laughs> you know, Jesus, in, in John 11, 35, the two words, say it with me. Jesus. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Or you can translate Jesus cried. Either one is fine. But, of course, the significance is not how short the verse is. But that Jesus himself showed sorrow, that he wept because his good friend Lazarus had died. I'm not a big crier myself, but there are times that I cry. Almost every time I watch the movie, it's a wonderful life. And I get to the end of the movie, and everything is falling apart for Jimmy Stewart. And his friends all come with money, and they, they put it in a big pile, and, and his uncle's counting the dollars and ringing it up. And, and all the people come through for him. And almost every time I watch that movie, I, I cry. <clears throat> Linda and I cried when we dropped our daughters off at college. 
You know, you drop them off with the bus for kindergarten and you cry. And then when they're 18, you take them to college and the same thing happens again. And, and you cry. I remember going into Fairfax Hospital's emergency room. In 1986, I got the call from my sister-in-law that my dad had had a massive heart attack and I had to come down. And I drove from Charlottesville. And I kept it all together until I walked into that room and my mom said, he's gone. And I just burst into tears because I love my dad very much. He did so much for me. Some of you have lost a spouse. C.S. Lewis lost his wife, Joy. He said in the grief observed, you tell me, quote, she goes on, but my heart and body are crying out, come back, come back. But I know this is impossible. I know that the thing I want is exactly the thing I can <coughs> never get. The old life, the jokes, the drinks, the arguments, the lovemaking, the tiny heartbreaking commonplace, on any view whatever to say she is dead, is to say, all that is gone. It is a part of the past. And the past is the past, and what that is what time means. And time itself is one more name for death. God does not keep us from tears. Because we love people, we will have to cry at times. But as we share in the tears of Jesus, we also remember, and the raising of Lazarus reminds us of Easter and still to come. And it reminds us that the resurrection is the ultimate and only final answer to our tears. That only then will God wipe all of our tears away. Now, until then, we have to cry again. Because the best way to go through a crisis and the best way to experience tears is to have people you love comfort you and go through those difficult times with you. And that's why God puts us in a church, so we can reach out to one another at the most difficult <coughs> times of all. And I pray that we will continue to do that with one another. And then on Easter morning, we will come and remember that even when it's Friday, Sunday is coming. The resurrection is still to come. At the end of every service, we have an invitation time. If anyone has a decision to make, we give you an opportunity to make that decision to accept Christ as Lord and Savior. Or uh, if you're already a Christian and you've been visiting our church, maybe to decide to move your membership. And this morning we're going to sing hymn number 358, Share His Love. And I'll ask you to turn to that hymn number 358, and let's stand.
are printed in your bulletin are congregational responses. Please bow with me. Father, bless Alan Smith on this day and the next several weeks as he begins to recover from his knee surgery. Let him know of our love and our concern for him. And let each of us be a blessing to one another, especially when we are going through times of grief. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs>
discounts on cards, so he's it's it's less expensive for him to race, but he doesn't have anybody paying. But I mean, if you finish first or something, you get money. Not where his rank is. Right? He's still the amateur ranks where there's no there's no prize purse or anything like that. Once you actually get to like a the pro am and like a, you can explain the class of racing system better. But once you actually get to a higher level of competitive professional level, there is there is a prize. Yeah. And, and uh, I know some of the BMX yeah. racers live in Greenville, North Carolina. Are there racers there? Or do you They've got, like, most states have anywhere from, I mean, you know, Texas is much bigger, California is kind of where the sport started, so those are kind of outliers, but yeah, most states have anywhere from two to three, four, five, sometimes ten BMX. Oh, yeah. 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 That's a lot of the freestyle where they do a lot of jumps and like big air jumps and stuff like that. That's, it's still on the bicycle, just a different discipline.